right, good day. Uh, welcome to another YMCA um, education series. We are free and open to the public, so we encourage you to spread the word and invite your family and friends to participate. We have approximately four to eight of these a month. Um, October, we've got a good lineup. We've got eight going in October, so check us out. Um, this program will last about an hour. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we can address them at the end. Matt does like his questions towards the end, so we will have a question time. Um, all right, thank you again for joining us for navigating the long-term care maze. Matt Margolis, Elder, Matt, Elder Law Attorney Matt Margolis will offer planning strategies and important matters to consider for adult children when they realize they need to help care for their aging parents. Um, yeah, with that, let's welcome Matt. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pam. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so as Pam said, my name is Matt Margolis. My partner, Lauren Walden, and I have a, um, a boutique elder law and estate planning practice in downtown Park Ridge. And we help folks with uh, things such as wills, trust, powers of attorney, special needs planning, asset protection, Medicaid, um, veterans benefits, we do that for people that are ages 18 all the way up to 100 plus. Um, we're, we're even doing powers of attorney for 18 year olds going off to college. So um, glad to be here today. Uh, we are talking about navigating the long-term care maze. Um, it's a pretty broad topic, um, a lot to cover. I'm gonna do my best to get to everything. Um, as Pam mentioned, it's based on the amount of time we have today. If you can type your questions into the chat box, that would be ideal. Um, I had to adjust and, and do this on my phone because my computer is not cooperating and I'm going to have a hard time seeing the chat box. So I can I'll, probably, I'll alert probably you easier to be there. Okay. And it's probably easier. I, I can take a look at it at the end. So uh, yeah, I, sometimes I take questions throughout. Today would be easier just to put them in the chat box. Um, yeah. So long term care maze. All right. Well, when we, you know, when, when we meet with clients, you know, this tends to be a pretty difficult um, aspect to navigate because a lot of people are doing it for the first time, um, you know, in the sense that, you know, whether it's their, or their husband or wife or mom or dad or brother or sister, that's, that's all of a sudden not doing so well. And, um, you know, the issue is how do we make sure that they're cared for appropriately? Um, you know, for some people, we can do that in the home, right? We might be able to uh, take care of them at home. You know, maybe maybe some loved ones start to, to provide some care, right? In a lot of situations, you might have that, that spouse sort of act as the first caregiver. Um, maybe it's the adult children that are acting as the first caregiver. If there, if there is not a spouse um, or if the spouse is not, not doing well, uh, maybe we're hiring caregivers, right? So even in the home, there are various um, types of care that we've seen. You know, um, one of the things that I would, you know, just, just one of the things to throw out there and, and, and I'm gonna try to kind of give you guys some little nuggets to take away. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of what we do is with the idea that we may have to apply for Medicaid at some point down the road. You know, Medicaid's a government benefit that will help pay for my long-term care um, in the event that, you know, I move into a nursing home or a supportive living facility. Those are the two types of places in Illinois where I can apply for Medicaid. Um, and so if I move into a nursing home or supportive living facility at some point, and my assets have gotten down to a point where I can apply for Medicaid, um, that's great. But there are certain qualifications to applying for Medicaid. Okay. And so I'm going to talk about these briefly, and then I'm going to kind of get back to what I was talking about with the caregivers. I think it'll provide a little bit of context. Um, and I understand that Medicaid will not be something that everybody will need. And so, I, you know, there'll obviously be some things I talk about today that will be applicable for some, but not for all. And that's just how all these talks are, are all, all these talks go. So when we look at Medicaid, if I'm a single individual applying for Medicaid, um, uh, and we'll talk about really Medicaid in a nursing home setting uh, for the most part, but it's very similar for, uh, for supportive living, for, for, for a supportive living facility. If I'm applying for Medicaid in, in either one of those settings, if I'm a single person, I can have no more than $2,000 of assets in my name. That means the total, so $2,000 total, and that includes checking accounts, savings accounts, brokerage accounts, cash value of life insurance policies, um, and, you know, stocks, mutual funds, 
real estate, et cetera. Okay, I cannot have more than $2,000 total. Um, as far as my income is concerned, right? Even if I get $2,000 a month from social security, I can continue to pay for my Medicare supplement. Um, and I get to keep, if I'm in a, if I'm in a skilled nursing facility, I get to keep $30 a month of my income. If I'm in a supportive living facility, I get to keep $90 a month of my income. And then the remainder of my income goes to the nursing home or supportive living facility. Okay. That's, it's called my my patient liability amount, okay, that's what I have to give them on a monthly basis. But then Medicaid picks up the rest of the tab. Not a terrible deal, okay, but I get to keep a very, very small portion of my income, obviously. Um, and then the last thing is that Medicaid has a look back period, okay, when I go to apply for Medicaid, Medicaid's going to want to see what did I do with my assets over the last five years, okay. And Medicaid's concerned with whether I gave anything away. They don't care if I um, you know, went out to dinner every night and, and, and spent a hundred dollars at, uh, you know, wildfire, uh, every night of the week. Okay. They don't care about that. They don't care if I bought a $4,000 flat screen TV a couple of years ago. Um, you know, they don't care if I wear like really expensive clothes and I bought a lot of clothes, What Medicaid cares about is, was I giving any money away? Right. Was I giving money to my kids or my grandkids? Okay, did I give something away for less than fair market value? So not just did I make a gift, right? We would all probably agree that if I wrote a check to my son for $10,000 and he didn't do anything for me other than just being my son, that would be a gift, okay? Uh, and I'm sure none of us would, agree, would, would disagree with that. But if I sold my car to my son and my car was worth $10,000 and I sold it to my son for $100, None of us would call that a gift, right? We'd say that I just gave my son a really good deal. But Medicaid would say, Matt, you transferred $9,900 for less than fair market value. Or you transfer that car for less than fair market value to the tune of $9,900. So basically, Medicaid would say, you gave away $9,900, right? Because I gave, I sold something. Yeah, I sold it. I didn't give it away but I sold it for much less than what it was actually worth, right? Because I have clients all the time say, well, can't I just buy my mom's house for $100 or for $1,000? And I say, of course you can. But if the house is worth $300,000, you're buying it for $1,000, Medicaid will argue that your mom gave away $299,000, okay? That's just how it works. And there are different ways. And, and then ultimately, if we give money away and we apply for Medicaid, right? So let's just say I'm down to $2,000 in my name. I'm in the nursing home. You know, I know how much of my income I'm going to have to give the nursing home every month. And, um, but I gave away $50,000 over the last five years. It doesn't matter if it was four years and six months ago or two months ago. If I gave away $50,000, Medicaid is going to give me a penalty. Okay. And the penalty is a little different, whether I'm in a nursing home or a supportive living facility. Um, but the way it works is that if I'm in a nursing home and the nursing home costs $10,000 a month, Medicaid's gonna take the amount of the gift, $50,000. They're gonna divide it by the monthly cost of care at the nursing home, which is 10,000. And they're gonna say, Matt, you gave away five months worth of care, right? If I didn't give that money away, I would be able to have paid five more months in the nursing home before I had to apply for Medicaid, right? That's their argument. And so Medicaid says, Matt, you're approved. You're approved for Medicaid but you gotta figure out a way to pay for the next five months out of pocket because the state's not gonna kick in and pay for you until you, for another five months. Now I gotta figure it out. Hopefully I can get that money back that I gave away to my son or my daughter or my grandson or wherever it went. I'm not gonna go into the details of what happens if I can't get the money back, okay? That, that'll take a little bit too much time today. It's just not a good scenario, right? Just, just to let everybody know, not, a, not an ideal place to be. Um, with support with a supportive living facility. And just so everybody knows a supportive living facility is more, um, you know what, I'll get to that in a second. We'll talk about the levels of care. Um, with a supportive living facility, the, the way that they determine the penalty, it's a, it's a daily amount. I think it's, I wanna say it's like a, $185 a day, something along the lines of that. It comes to about 5,500 or so dollars a month. And so they just use that as the, the penalty divisor, right? So if I gave away 50,000, the divisor is 5,500. 
you know, I gave away roughly nine months worth of care. Okay. And I'd have to pay for nine months out of pocket at that supportive living facility before Medicaid kicked in. Um, again, giving things away, if we believe Medicaid uh, could be on the horizon, if we believe that we might need long-term care in a, faci in a facility in the near-ish future, um, it's not ideal just to start giving stuff away. There are strategic ways to plan, strategic ways to sort of protect assets. Um, we might not get into all of that today. Um, I, I have another talk where I discuss that a little, in, in a lot more detail. Um, and so, yeah, if you have, all, all I'll say is if you have interest in trying to protect assets for you or a loved one, great. Give me a call, call another elder law attorney. These are things we can help with, but there's a strategic way to do it. Um, typically when people just kind of do it willy nilly on their own, it doesn't work out so well. Um, it's just, you know, what we've seen over the years. I talked about what would happen with how Medicaid works if I'm a single individual. The, if it, the way it's different if I'm married is that everything I just said about myself is the same. I'm limited to $2,000 in my name. I get to keep $30 a month of my income. If I'm in a skilled nursing facility, $90 a month if I'm in supportive living. And there's the five-year look back period. If I'm married, then all that stays the same, but my spouse can have $109,560 of assets. Again, checking accounts, savings accounts, brokerage accounts, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, cash value of life insurance included, um, $109,560, a house, there's no, limit, there's no limit on the value of the house, and a car. There's no limit on what the car is worth. Um, so that's what my spouse can have. And then my spouse is entitled to $2,739 a month of income. Um, and so if, if, if my wife's income is $2,000 a month and my income is $1,000 a month, I can pay for my Medicare supplement. I can keep my $30. And then because I'm married, rather than giving the remainder of my income to the nursing home or supportive living facility, I can transfer my income to my wife to get her up to that $2,739 a month number. Okay, I can get her up to that. I can't put her over it. In some limited circumstances, we can. But for the most part, I, I, can, I can get her up to that 2739 number. Okay, and then if I have any additional income that's left over after that, then I have to give it to the nursing home. That 2739 is gonna go up after the first of the year. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I wanna say it's gonna be like $3,365. So it's a significant change. I mean, it's gonna go, I wanna say close to $600 a month. Um, that's a big deal, right? An extra $600 a month in income uh, for an individual can mean a lot, right? Um, so I'm glad that uh, the state is, is changing things a little bit and you know, kind of getting on par with, with some of the other states in this country. Um, okay, that was my little tangent on Medicaid, just to have, have everybody have an understanding as to how it works, because it'll provide some context um, for some of the, when we talk about some of these levels of care, right? So in navigating the long-term care maze, right, we have this idea of, of being cared for in the home. And I would argue the vast majority of people when presented with an option of being cared for in their own home or moving into a nursing home um, are probably gonna raise their hand as far as wanting to stay in their own home, right? There's not too many clients that are like, oh yeah, I would love to move into a nursing home, sign me up. Um, you know, it's, a it, it, it just, it's necessary for some people. Um, right, due to the level of care they need, due to their financial situation and the, and the fact that they would need to apply for Medicaid. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we all do things based on our needs and what we can afford. That's just how it goes. Um, and for most of us, money is, doesn't grow on trees and it will run out at some point. And long-term care, for those of you that don't know, is, is not inexpensive these days. Um, you know, when looking at caregivers in the home, you know, the average caregiving company right now is probably charging about $30 an hour for a caregiver. Um, when I started doing this, uh, I don't like that I'm starting to use that phrase. When I started doing this close to 12 years ago, um, that number was probably closer to $21 to $23 an hour. You know, so it's, I've seen it rise significantly in, in the last 10 to 12 years. Um, and so even when we're looking at care at home, right? Some people are gonna take care of their loved ones on their own. Some people are gonna hire private caregivers. 
Um, some people might hire private caregivers through a company, right? So I'm, I'm signing a contract with ABC Caregiving Company. They're agreeing to provide, you know, 40 hours a week of care at $30 an hour, and it's going to cost us $5,000 a month, roughly, for that care. Um, then I've got some clients that don't go through an agency, right? And they hire somebody who maybe was a caregiver for their aunt who passed away, or she, this woman or this man was a caregiver for, you know, their best friend's mom, and their best friend's mom passed away, and, and now, you know, we're going to use her. We, we've inherited her as our caregiver, and that's great, right? Because this person is only charging 18 or 20 or $23 an hour versus the $30 an hour that the agencies are charging. That makes a big difference, right? If somebody needs 40 hours of care a week, let's say, um, you know, the difference between $20 an hour and $30 an hour is $400, right? That's $1,600 a month, roughly. Um, you know, that's $20,000, 20 to $23,000 a year. It's a huge difference for people. Um, so I get it. I totally understand that people might hire that private caregiver, um, but we need to do it in a smart way, right? We talked about the idea of Medicaid. And Medicaid doesn't like it if we gift assets. Well, if I'm paying a private caregiver, right, not through an agency, and I never sign a contract with this private caregiver, and then I go to apply for Medicaid, Medicaid's gonna wanna see five years of my bank statements, right? That's just what they're gonna require from everybody. It's not like they're just gonna require that from me because I was paying this private caregiver. They wanna see what did I do with all my money, right? Everybody, they wanna see that. And they're gonna see, gosh, I was writing checks every two weeks to the tune of you know $2,000 to Maria. And all of a sudden I apply for Medicaid and they're like, hey Matt, you wrote checks to, you know, it was like, you wrote, $200,000 worth of checks or $100,000 worth of checks to this Maria person over the last five years. What, tell us about this. Well, Maria was a caregiver, right? She was my caregiver. She took care of me. I paid her, you know, $20 an hour. She was working 40 hours a week, blah, blah, blah. All right. Well, that's great. Where's the contract? Show us the contract that, show, that, 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 that shows that you hired Maria and that she was your caregiver and, and what she was being paid and when she started and what the terms of the contract were and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I don't have a contract. We, ne we never signed one. She was just a private caregiver. You know, she wasn't through an agency. Sorry about that. You know, our take then is that you were just gifting money to somebody named Maria. You know, whether she was, we don't care if she wasn't your daughter or your son, maybe she was a niece, maybe she was a good friend, maybe she was just somebody you were giving money to and then they were giving it back to your kids. This happens. Okay, we've had this happen with our with our clients over the years. It's not an ideal situation to be in. You know, okay, there are ways to sort of try to try to make up for this. You know, we we can you know have the caregivers sign affidavits after the fact, saying that yes, I was a caregiver, I was paid this much, etc. You know, we get affidavits from me, the person applying for Medicaid. If I'm incapacitated, my power of attorney is going to be the one to to, to sign the affidavit. Um, if I've got, you know, if I've got, we've had situations where there were multiple private caregivers, you know, there were two or three or four, and now we need to get affidavits from all of them. And you know what? Some of them may not be willing uh, to sign an affidavit. Some of them are scared. Maybe they were not claiming the money on their taxes. Maybe they're not legal residents of the United States. You know, even though Medicaid's not going to go to the IRS, Medicaid's not going to go and, and try to deal with any immigration issues, somebody who's scared of those things is gonna be scared of those things regardless as to what we tell them and what guarantees we might make them. So again, let's get in front of it. If we're gonna hire that private caregiver, make sure there is a written contract, okay? Call us, call another elder law attorney. I'm just gonna say call an elder law attorney. That's what I am. So you guys, you guys should know that hopefully by now. Call an elder law attorney, get some help. Spend a little bit of money to put a contract in place so that down the road, you don't have an issue. What you don't wanna be stuck, what you don't wanna deal with is a situation where you gave away, not you gave away, you paid a caregiver $100,000, you don't have a contract, you can't get around it with Medicaid, and now you've got a $100,000 penalty. And now you've gotta pay for an extra 10 months out of pocket at a nursing home before Medicaid will kick in. These are uphill battles, okay? It is so much better, and we all know this. Nobody's going to argue with me on this, I'm sure. 
we all know it's better to be proactive than reactive. Being reactive, our options are less and they tend to not be as ideal. So let's be as proactive as we can be and try to set ourselves up for success versus failure, right? And as I said from the beginning, these are uncharted waters for most people. This is the first time most people are going to be dealing with this, right? There's a first time for everybody, right? Whether it's going to school, right? We just dropped our daughter off at preschool today, right? First time for that. First time for, you know, going off to college. First time for starting a new job. And there's some not ideal first times, you know, first time applying for Medicaid, first time moving into a nursing home, first time hiring a caregiver. All I'm, my, my only goal is to, again, to give you guys some little nuggets you can take away here, and hopefully you can benefit from using these down the road or passing them on to a friend. Um, you know, if there's one thing I know, there's just such a lack of, of education on a lot of this down, you know, for people. Um, I mean, there, it's out there. It's just people don't seek it out enough. Um, okay, so get that contract in place. All right, I cannot advocate that enough. And listen, you can even pay an adult child. If you want to pay your son or daughter to be your caregiver, your niece or nephew, your, your grandchild, great. Again, even more important to have a written contract if you're hiring a family member to be a caregiver. Okay, even more important because that's going to eat the, the, the state of Illinois it will for sure default to that being a gift. And you're going to have that'll be even more of an uphill battle. Okay. So we've got caregivers in the home. And then if we're talking about moving outside the house, you know, now we're talking about, you know, the landscape of the different facilities that are out there, right? We've got independent living, we've got assisted living, we've got supportive living, we've got memory care, we've got skilled nursing facilities. Um, let's step back for a second, okay? Independent living, this really isn't a, a, a setting where we need care. Um, if I'm moving into an independent living facility, this just might be a situation where, you know what, I don't, I don't need to maintain, I don't want to maintain the 3,000 or 4,000 or 6,000 square foot house I've had for the last 30 or 40 years or 50 years. You know, I don't even want to necessarily maintain my condo, right? Um, whatever it might be, right? And so maybe we decide, hey, I want to go into an independent living. I want to live in a community with a lot of uh, people that are more my age group, right? With a lot of my peers. And listen, there's activities, there's sort of like, it, 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 it creates the idea of more, um, a little more helpful for like built-in friendships, uh, meeting people, if, I'm, if you're a social person. And so independent living, I, I kind of say it's like, it's like a dorm, it's like being in a dorm building, right? Not a dorm room, right? The, the rooms are a lot nicer. It's like being in a dorm building, a dormitory for seniors, right? Typically, I think it's anywhere 55 plus. Um, and again, independent living on its own, is not does not involve any care. It might it might involve you know you might get a meal a day with it. They might make up your they might do your laundry once a week. Again, every place has their own bells and whistles, and you know a lot of them are a la carte. You can pay more or less money depending on the services you want or don't want. But independent living on its own isn't going to really include any care. Now you can be an independent living and have a caregiver. Some independent living facilities allow that. Some don't. Okay. Independent living will uh, will be will always be 100% private pay. Okay, there will be no government benefits that you can use to pay for independent living. Um, let me ask this, and maybe Pam can monitor the the chat box. Uh, I, I, there's a there's a specific veterans benefit that I'm happy to discuss very briefly if it if it would apply to anybody here. But if it doesn't apply to anybody, then it's something I really don't want to spend even even a couple minutes on. All right, three, two, one. All right, no veterans. All right, so we'll pass down that. Um, so after independent living, right, maybe we get to a point where we need some level of care, right? Maybe we can't, independent living is not something that's gonna work for us anymore. Um, and so the two kind of places that we can go to from here, uh, I'm gonna say maybe three, are memory care, assisted living, and supportive living. Um, so, you know, memory care is going to be for those individuals that, you know, it's, it's the reason why they need help is because they have issues with memory, right? They, have, they suffer from, from some form of dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. Um, you know, memory care, any place that, that, for the most part, okay, there will be some that will make my statement wrong, but it's, 
very, very few and far between. 95% of the time you hear uh, of a place that's memory care or has memory care in the name or a place that specializes in memory care, it will be private pay. Okay, there will be no Medicaid. They will not take Medicaid. It will be 100% private pay. Whether you pay out of pocket, whether you have long-term care insurance that will help pay for it, okay? Um, but, but pretty much every single place that has memory care as part of what they do, it's going to be private pay out of pocket, okay? So memory care is one option, right? And that's obviously a great, if, you know, if, if people can afford it and that's what they need, memory care facilities are great. You know, they tend to have um, a staff that's, that's trained um, in a way that where they understand the various forms of dementia and sort of what people deal with and how the disease progresses and how the various forms of dementia progress. Um, and so they have a staff that's, that's well-trained and able to help to better care for individuals that, that suffer from that disease. Um, some of them might have programs or, or so, sort of quote unquote curriculums. Um, like annual curriculums where they literally do things sort of every day of the year or certain days of the week that are really, you know, there to help stimulate the brain and to, uh, you know, we, we know that unfortunately anybody with some form of dementia, they will not get better. Um, and so for the most part, the best that we can do is try to slow the progression of the disease as much as we can. Okay. Um, so memory care is one. Then we have assisted living and supportive living. Assisted living and supportive living are, are very similar levels of care. Okay, assisted living and supportive living are going to be, you know, uh, I can't really, I can't, I can't do everything on my own, but I also don't need help with everything, right? So maybe I need help with a few activities of daily living. You know, maybe I need somebody to um, help me with my medication. Um, it's not necessarily an activity of daily living, but maybe I need somebody to help me with my medication. Maybe I need somebody to help me get dressed in the morning. Um, maybe I need somebody to my, you know, my hands don't work well for whatever reason. Um, maybe I need somebody to feed me. Maybe I need somebody to help me take a shower, um, get dressed if I didn't already say that. You know, so, so if I need some help with a couple activities of daily living, assisted living uh, or supportive living might be the place uh, that for me. Any place that is assisted living, okay, if it's, a, if it's true assisted living, it's private pay, okay? No benefits, no Medicaid. Uh, they will not take any Medicaid. Um, if it's a uh, supportive living facility, which I referenced earlier, supportive, every single supportive living facility out there, every single one in Illinois that is called a supportive living facility, they take Medicaid, every single one, okay? Um, the problem is there aren't enough of them Right, and there are so many people in Illinois that um, could benefit from there being more supportive living facilities, uh, because what ends up happening is you've got a lot of people that are that don't necessarily have all the needs uh, that somebody would have to move into a, a skilled nursing facility, but they end up going into a skilled nursing facility because um, there are more skilled nursing facilities out there that take Medicaid than there are supportive living facilities in general. Um, and so hopefully, you know, you know, we, we, I'm sure a lot of you see a lot of these places popping up all over the place, right? If you live anywhere near the YMCA, I live in this area. Um, you know, I mean, I, it, it's like every six months, there's a new long-term care community, uh, popping up. Um, I just wish more of them were, were supportive living. Um, so supportive living, Medicaid, okay. You can private pay, you can definitely move into supportive living and private pay but every supportive living facility accepts Medicaid. And again, the level of care is, is, is very similar to assisted living, which is 100% private pay, assisted living. Um, then we look at the skilled nursing facilities. Okay, so when we look at skilled nursing facilities, this is sort of that, you know, um, last level of care, if you will. Uh, I mean, outside of, uh, you know, maybe hospice, um, but even somebody that's on hospice could be in a skilled nursing facility, a skilled nursing setting. Um, the skilled nursing facility is gonna be a situation where, you know, I really need quite a bit of help with my activities of daily living. I'm not gonna be able to really handle, 
doing a lot on my own. Maybe I'm really not mobile. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm bedridden. Um, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, again, I'm just really not able to handle most things um, on my own and do, do much for myself. Okay. And so, so I'm looking at a skilled nursing facility. In Illinois, we have skilled nursing facilities that accept Medicaid and we have skilled nursing facilities that don't accept Medicaid. Okay. Um, again, sort of in the general North Shore area, there are plenty of skilled nursing facilities that accept Medicaid. Okay. Um, I, I almost want to say there might be more that accept Medicaid than don't. Um, may not be a true statement, so don't quote me on it, but there's a lot. There's a lot. I mean, you know, in our practice, it's way more common that we run into people, run into clients that are that are either in a skilled nursing facility and, and will be applying for Medicaid or have not moved into a skilled nursing facility yet, but are looking at one that, that, that takes Medicaid. Um, listen, people that have five, six million dollars that don't necessarily need to worry about, you know, their money running out, those people, I'm not saying they don't come to us, but they don't tend to come to us. You know, they don't, they don't have the issue of how do I pay for care at some point? You know, they've got enough money to support themselves. You know, so the majority of people that we're, that we're, that we're running into are people where it's like, hey, we've got some money, but we know it's not going to last forever. And we really need to plan for what will happen when it, when it, if and when it does run out. Um, and so, yeah, there are plenty of places around here that accept Medicaid. Um, and a nursing home that accepts Medicaid also takes <laughs> private pay, right? Um, and, here's, and here's the way a lot of them will work, right? So I tell clients this all the time. And one thing that I would really, that I, that, to share with everybody that, that's, that's listening today, um, here, is, here is a situation that's not very ideal, right? And this happens often, right? We've got the adult daughter or the adult son calls us, says, hey, Matt, uh, you know, so-and-so referred me and, you know, my mom's been at home with a caregiver for the last four years. And you know what? Mom is down to $20,000 and... I need to get her out of her condo and into a nursing home and then apply for Medicaid. You know, can you help us? This is not an ideal scenario because even though there are plenty of places out there that take Medicaid, um, a lot of majority of them that take Medicaid, okay, the vast majority of them that take Medicaid that are more desirable, okay? Uh, let's say at the end of the day, a nursing home is a nursing home. And I would argue that you could go to five nursing homes and probably not necessarily love any one of them. Um, but the ones that are more desirable are not going to want somebody just because you can have $2,000 and apply for Medicaid, you know, as a single person or, or you know, you know, I've talked about what you, what you can have as a married couple. Even if you meet that criteria and you walk into the nursing home and say, all right, well, I want to, you know, they say, all right, well, we have, we have capacity, um, you know, you can move in, you have to be prepared that they are gonna want you to pay privately for some period of time. Um, they might want you to pay privately for a month or two. They might want you to pay privately for six months. Um, this is the case for supportive living as well. I say this because you don't want to wait until the last minute thinking that, okay, right now I'm down to 20 grand. Let's start to make a plan. You know, we'll get her moved out. And by the time she moves out of her condo, she'll be down to, you know, $5,000 and we'll get her on Medicaid. Again, the nursing home might want some private pay. So don't wait until you're down to $10,000 or $20,000 or $30,000. If the writing's on the wall, right? If you see that your mom or dad or, or, or husband or wife or uncle or aunt or whoever you're an advocate for, if you see that the money is going down, right, because they're spending money in assisted living or uh, where, where if they run out of money in assisted living, they will get kicked out and they will have to go to a skilled nursing facility and apply for Medicaid. Again, not an ideal scenario. So in general, whether they're living at home, whether they're living in a, uh, uh, a facility of some sort that does not take Medicaid and it's only private pay, if you see that money dwindling, you need to start looking at places that take Medicaid. Even though that might not be ideal, I mean, again, in, now, unless, unless you can afford to pay out of your own pocket for your loved one, then that's a different story. But if we're using their money only, which 95% of the time we are, 
you know, there's no magic number, you know, maybe when they're down to a hundred thousand, you start to take a little bit of a look. I'd say for sure, when you're down to like 70, 60, 50,000, you really got to be hitting the pavement and seeing what's out there, seeing what the options are, right? I'd rather you look too early and find a place that says, oh yeah, you know, we only need two months worth of private pay and then we'll let them apply for Medicaid. But again, your follow-up question should be, is that always the case? Are you always only gonna need two months of private pay or is that just based on your, the vacancies you have in your building now? Because I'll tell you, those numbers can change. Today, nursing home X might say, well, mom, your mom needs to private pay for two months and then anytime after that, if she runs out of money, she can apply for Medicaid. But I think we could go back to nursing home X six months from now and, they, and nursing home X could say, well, mom needs to private pay for four months. And anytime after four months, if she runs out of money, then we'll let her apply for Medicaid. These things can change. Okay, what they tell me today could be different in six months. And again, a lot of the times it's based on their consensus, right? How much, how much space do they have available? You know, a place that takes Medicaid, they have a certain amount of beds that are certified for Medicaid by the state. So in some of these cases, the reason why they're asking for private money up front is because if all their Medicaid beds are full, then they can only move you into a private pay room. And sometimes they'll say, you know, two, three months. I hate to say this, but they're saying that because they figure in two to three months, somebody might pass away and they will have an empty bed. You know, maybe that's just their average, whatever it is. Um, you can't ask enough questions when you're looking for places for your parents or whoever you're, you're advocating for. Um, you can't ask enough questions when it comes to hiring a caregiver, right? Think back, you know, if anybody ha here has kids, think back to when you were putting your kids in, in preschool or daycare or, or hiring a nanny or, or hiring a babysitter. I would have to think that you were pretty careful about the situations you put your little kids in and making sure that they were going to be safe and that they were going to be taken care of. Guys, it doesn't change. It's just a different... It's just a different chapter of life, right? Now we have to ask those same questions, financial, care-wise, as it relates to our older loved ones. They're just as vulnerable. In, in many situations, they're just as vulnerable, pardon me, as our little ones, okay? Um, the... I want to say two things, and then I, I then I'll and then I'll, I'll I'll end it, and I'll take I can take a couple questions. Um, number one, I'm a big advocate for long-term care insurance. I don't sell it. Uh, you know, it's not something we do. Um, I wish more clients came to us that had it. I get it is a it is an expensive vehicle. It can be. There's tons of different policies out there. Um, I think it's at least worth it for people to look into it. Some of these long-term care insurance policies nowadays have uh, life insurance writers. And so, you know, it kind of does away with the use it or lose it mentality that I think a lot of people uh, had uh, for, 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 the, for many years as it relates to long-term care insurance. Um, so that's something I would just, I'm just throwing out there as something that I think it's important to people, uh, for people to, to maybe at least take a look into. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention really briefly, just so people keep this on their radar, uh, we see this a lot. So just so everybody knows, Medicare, for the most part, is not a, a benefit that's going to pay for our long-term care. All right. I just want to make sure people understand that. It's not a benefit that's going to cover our long-term care. Other than, okay, the only situation where Medicare really cut, comes in to take care of any long-term care issues is if I'm in the hospital and I have at least three overnights in a hospital and I'm, and I'm noted as inpatient, okay, um, I have to have at least three nights where I'm defined as inpatient status, where my status is inpatient. I could be at the hospital for eight days, okay, as long as three of those days I was inpatient. Um, if I'm in the hospital at least three nights with inpatient status, and then I get discharged to a skilled nursing facility typically for rehab, Medicare will cover some of the rehab. Um, Okay, Medicare will cover the first 20 days at 100%. Okay, the first 20 days, Medicare covers at 100%. And then for another 80 days after that, so for a total of 100, 
another 80 days after the first 20 where Medicare covers at 100%. Those for remaining 80 days, Medicare will cover 80%. And if I have a true Medicare supplement, okay, a true Medicare supplement, the supplement will pick up the other 20%. So it's possible that I could have up to 100 days where I have zero out of pocket because both Medicare and my Medicare supplement picked up the tab, if you will. Um, now it's a little bit different if we have a Medicare, you know, some of these Medicare Advantage plans, they're a little bit different. They don't cover as much. There is a little bit more out of pocket that can, that can come into play. Um, the Medicare Advantage plans tend to not be as expensive as some of these Medicare supplements, hence the way they work in this situation. And so at the end of the day, listen, if nothing else, go talk to the person you bought your Medicare supplement from, your Medicare Advantage plan from, or wherever you got it. Inquire, see how this works. If you're, if you're in a you know, post-hospitalization rehab setting, it would be a good idea. It would behoove you to figure out how your policy works and what you may or may not be responsible for. But I'm, I just wanted to let everybody know this is really the one situation where Medicare will cover your long-term care costs. And the one thing that you really need to, to make sure you do is that if it's, if it's you or a loved one in the hospital and you're in the hospital for three, four, five days, nights, you need to be asking what your status is. You need to know, because if you're going to be discharged to rehab, you need to know if you're going to be out of pocket for that rehab or if Medicare is going to cover it. Because you might be in the hospital for three nights, but maybe the first night you were under observation and the second two nights you were inpatient. Just because you spend a night does not make you inpatient automatically. And I will tell you that we've had some people learn this the hard way, where we've had clients reach out to us and say, my dad just got out of rehab. He was there for 37 days and they sent him a bill for $20,000. And that's because he was not, he did not meet the three inpatient nights, uh, did not meet that. And rehab can cost five, six, $700 a day because of all the various services that you're being provided in rehab, OT, PT, speech therapy, whatever it might be. Okay, it's not just like living in a nursing home permanently, which the average is probably about $300 a day now, maybe $320 a day. Um, because when you're in a nursing home permanently, you're not getting all those therapies. That's just, that's not what they're doing. You're just living there. But for rehab, you know, they're, you're getting all these extra services. So it's very expensive. And if you have to pay for that out of pocket, it can really be a rude awakening. So again, Make sure you understand, make sure on a daily basis you're asking what your status is. And if it's if you're if you're hearing that it's under observation, you've got to get an advocate involved. Okay. Whether it's a loved one, whether you know, there are there are patient advocates out there, you know, that we that we don't do that, but we have we put clients in touch with these patient advocates that can help. They understand the medical, and you know, a lot of them have medical backgrounds, they understand and they can really advocate on your behalf to say. You know, you have Susie listed as an under observation for these two days, but this really should have been impatient. You know, and you can and you can fight it. You can try to get it overturned. Um, so it is ten sixteen. I know that we normally have until ten fifteen for these. Um, I appreciate everybody um, being willing to start a little bit later this morning. Um, I was just didn't have it on my calendar. It was my daughter's first day of preschool, and um, I wanted to make sure that I was there for her. So um, I am happy to answer questions for a couple minutes here if anybody has any. Any questions? It's a lot of information, but it was really good. Thanks, Jim. Any questions? If you have any questions, feel free to email me or Matt um, and we and I can or I can get it to Matt um, um, and we can get your answer solved. Um, next yeah. month. Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to say, I was just going to say, I'm going to put my um, email in the chat box. Thanks. It's easier for you to do it because you have it memorized. There you go. Um, next month on October 5th, uh, again at Wednesday at 9 15, Matt will be talking about discussing important documents. He was talking about some of that today. Um, so he'll go in a little bit more detail about discussing um, important documents. Uh, awesome. 
All right, we're gonna close out. Thank you again to Matt Margolis for talking to us today on behalf of the North Suburban YMCA and our YAS series. We thank you again for supporting organizations like this, um, especially this is goes out to the community. It's really awesome. Um, blah, blah, blah. Our next talk is actually next Thursday at noon talking about long-term long -term care planning. So similar um, to Matt's talk today, but it won't be from the, um, law aspect it'll be talking more about um uh some more financial aspect of that so um hooray thank you so much for being on the call today and we look forward to hopefully seeing you in a month for one of matt's next talk if not sooner for one of our next talks and don't forget about senior palooza september 14th please make um come visit um senior palooza it's great to get out and um uh get some access to people or it does also will be virtual. So September 14th, Senior Palooza, have a great day. So excited that your preschooler got her, her first day today, Matt. Thanks, thanks, me too. Yay, thanks for everyone to come on the call late and we'll talk to you all soon. And I'll see anybody at Senior Palooza that goes. I'll be there for a little bit at least. Yay, I'll be there too. All right, bye guys. Right. Bye.